the most remarkable classified ads appeared in the penny saver. It began tombstone for sale and continued didn't die, don't need it. The details followed in an ad in a report that someone from the newspaper put together when they came to investigate. And there they interviewed a man named Art Krantz, who had taken out the ad in the paper. Turns out that the tombstone had been purchased by his sister, who was told she was going to die soon. But the sister experienced recovery and decided she didn't want the tombstone lying around her house, so she asked her brother to get rid of it. He kept it in his living room for a while and then moved it out onto the front porch and then ran the ad tombstone for sale in the hope of finding a buyer for it. So it was in the city of Nain. A tombstone had been prepared for this young boy, the only son of a widowed woman. It turned out they didn't need it because they encountered Jesus that day. But that's a different kind of coincidence than the ones we normally encounter on our roadways. This spring has been no different than any other springtime in that it never fails that as we get into the latter weeks of May and the first weeks of June and schools are preparing their graduation ceremonies and kids are preparing to walk across stage, get their diploma, and begin their life, which is why the ceremony is also called commencement, that there are stories on the news of traffic accidents on the highway. And so it was that on such a highway a couple of weeks ago, two girls were off for their senior ditch day, had taken the day off from school, and were going to head out to the beach. We're not sure exactly what happened, but for some reason the girls swerved across the center line of the highway and hit another car head on. That car was occupied by four teenage boys on their way to their senior class activity. One of the girls and two of the boys were killed. And I know from working with my own students, teenagers think they are invincible and that nothing can ever hurt them. They can be as daring as they like and they'll get away with it. That's why the death of one of their classmates is particularly devastating for them. And so the school administration has brought in counselors to talk to the kids and try and help them get through this set of circumstances. But you know, it's circumstances like that that cause us to question our faith and cause us to wonder God's place in such events. Here we have a funeral procession and Jesus approaches the people and says to the grieving mother, do not weep. How could he say that? How can you approach somebody under those circumstances and tell them not to cry? If anybody had a reason to cry, it was this woman. But Jesus actually believed the things that he said were true. That he was there as God's representative and that he possessed the power of God and was able to be the presence of God in any and all circumstances. And so Jesus is able to step into that kind of chaos and bring order. Now, how many of you remember playing with magnets when you were a kid? Okay, a couple of you. 
You know that magnets have two ends, and we very cleverly call them north and south. And if you were to try and put two magnets together, I see you drawing it over there, you're right. If you take the two north ends, they're going to... You, they repel each other. Turn it around, and north will be attracted to south. But I remember one particular science experiment where a teacher took a sheet of paper, and on it she sprinkled a whole bunch of iron filings that covered the paper. One big gray blob. Then she took a horseshoe-shaped magnet and put it under the paper and pulled it through. And you know what happened after that. All those little iron filings were attracted to the magnet and formed themselves into the shape of the magnet. That magnet had the power to take chaos and bring it order. So it is for us. When we look at some of the circumstances in our lives that seem chaotic, that seem traumatic, that are filled with sadness or despair, and we ask God to become involved in this situation. We're not asking God to explain why things happened the way they did. It doesn't matter why they happened the way they did. We know God didn't do it. God doesn't take people from this world. God does not take children. God did not cause that traffic accident on the highway outside of Fresno. But you know, we like to think that way. We like to think that our world makes sense and if we do good, we get good. If we do bad, we get bad. It's actually an old Hebrew system of beliefs. And it's common even today. Now I'm gonna take the microphone out of the stand for a second and revert back to my teenage years and when I was in high school and share with you one of the worst songs I have ever heard in my entire life. It's not the worst song because it's filled with bad language. It's not the worst song because of the musical arrangement. Although I did play some music in class for my students last week when they were taking their exams. I told them I would put on the radio station of their choice. And they requested something called Deaf Punk, which near as I gather, is people being tortured because it's nothing but screaming. And, and, and they played one song, and the guy was just, ah, 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 ah. And then the next one came on and was introduced. I'm gonna play a tender love ballad for you, one that I wrote myself. Ah, ah. And I'm thinking, somebody's gotta help that boy. <laughs> but you know, I can't. Make fun of you and the music you enjoy without being able to take the mirror and look upon myself and remember this oldie but goodie. Oh, where, oh, where can my baby be? The Lord took her away from me. She's gone to heaven, so I've got to be good so I can see my baby when I leave of this old world. If that is the biggest pile of poop, I've ever heard in my life, I don't know what is. First of all, the guy who was driving his car didn't pay attention, went into a skid, and crashed. And as a result of the accident, his girlfriend died. God didn't take her away from him. And I can understand why he would want to be with her again. But that's not going to happen because he's lived a good enough life. Yet people believe that claptrap all the time. That if we're good enough on this earth, God will take us to heaven. There is nothing in scripture that supports that belief. Rather, the exact opposite. Scripture points out our helplessness in the face of sin. Our powerlessness in the face of our trials. But it also reminds us of the profound depth of God's love. 
As I mentioned earlier, Jesus, on his own initiative, out of a sense of his own compassion, approached this widow and brought her son back to life. If Jesus had the power to do that, he has the power to do that for us. He can touch each of our lives and the circumstances that we deal with on a daily basis and be a part of that with us, to strengthen us, to guide us. And throughout this Pentecost season so far, we have been identifying the fact that God has placed His Spirit, His presence, within our lives. And that it's His presence in our lives that can make all the difference. I remember reading once, I was sitting torn by grief. Someone came and talked to me of God's dealings, of why it happened, of hope beyond the grave. He talked constantly. He said things I knew were true. But I was unmoved except to wish he'd go away. And he finally did. Then another came and sat by me. He didn't talk. He didn't ask leading questions. He just sat behind me for an hour or more, listened when I said something, answered briefly, shared my sorrow, prayed simply, and left. I was moved. I was comforted. I hated to see him go. You know, God doesn't expect us to have all the answers so that we can share them with people. But he expects us to show the same compassion toward people in their trials that he shows to us. One closing story. An elderly man sat on a park bench late one fall afternoon. The air was cold and he was tired. He'd been shopping for two hours and was worn out. And so he stopped on his way home to sit at a park bench and rest a little before continuing. Now he was not a man who was prone to feeling sorry for himself, but nevertheless that day a profound sense of loneliness came upon him. And the thoughts of going home to an empty house did not excite him. He stared at his large round hands as he worked them back and forth between his knees. And suddenly, to his startled amazement, another hand, small, pink, and chubby, was placed on top of his own. He jerked his head up and was faced by a little child who looked at him, smiled, and said in a raspy voice, Hiya! He got to his feet, took the child by the hand, and gently led it back to his mother, who was standing just a few feet away. Thank you, she said. I hope he didn't disturb you. But he just learned to walk. And now he needs to go say hello to everybody he sees. The man smiled, hefted his packages, and continued on home. The ache was gone now. And so was the loneliness. Memories of that chubby little hand and that grinning face stuck with him. Just a few minutes before, he was possessed only by a thought of sadness and isolation, totally unaware of how a few moments later God was going to intervene in his life and remind him how loved he was. So God intervenes in our life and reminds us. Technically, Father's Day is next weekend, but since we are observing it today, let today be our Heavenly Father's Day. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.